right, I'm going to start a new project here. I uh, need to make a, a rubber bushing. Fits in here. This is what holds the handlebars on the Pook 250. Uh, this is the part that covers it up. I guess it goes this way around. Uh, and, and that's what bolts it down. Uh, but this is the same on the 175, the same length, the bushing. So uh, what I want to do is make a bushing. The handlebars go through here, but the handlebars are quite a bit smaller than this, than this clamp diameter. And this rubber bushing, I assume, isolates vibration. I'm not sure what the purpose is of it, but it's something that nobody uses nowadays, I bet. But uh, I don't see them for sale on the Internet, and I think I can make a mold to, to make that part. And I don't think it'll take too long to do it. Uh, so this is going to be kind of a document of how I make the mold. This is the material I selected. It's a piece about 8 inches long, uh, but I'm going to cut it in half so the molds will be, you know, about 4 inches long, a little less than 4 inches long. And as the first step goes, first thing I got to do is bolt these two, two pieces together. So I'm going to saw this in two and get my two pieces. I got to file it to get rid of some burrs on here. I'll probably do that first because this thing's been banging around in my junk metal thing for a while. And it's going to be made out of aluminum. So step number one, bolt the two pieces together, always. And step number two will be to lay it out. Cut the blocks exactly in two. It's not quite eight inches long, but I found the exact center and uh, saw the aluminum off. I don't, I don't use any coolant when I'm cutting aluminum. Usually, it cuts better without water. Uh, if I was going to use water, it'd probably be better to have just straight water, not any lubricant with it. Use kerosene or something like that, or some cat magic that would work for a lubricant. But basically, I usually saw aluminum dry and uh, just let the, the chips come out where, where they may. Okay, next thing I'm doing laying out where my holes that are going to bolt it together go. Just using a combination square, putting them about a oh, quarter inch from each end. It, it doesn't matter, they don't have to be real exact because uh, it's just going to be transfer the hole into the other piece anyway, so uh, and they're going to be pretty long. I'm going to put in 1032 screws to fasten that down, and what I'm going to cut in there for a mold will be basically a copy of this thing. And uh, It'll be made out of rubber. Now where I'm going to put the, that screw in there, it's going to have to be have a counter bore on there uh, for the head of this screw. It's a, I usually use 1032 screws for a lot of things because you don't have to drill too big a hole and they're pretty strong. And uh, uh, this this will be countersunk in there, and whenever you countersink, you want to use a drill that's one thirty second bigger than the screw size. So this is a ten thirty two, which is a, a three sixteenths bolt. So I want to go one thirty second of an inch drill size over that for the pilot on the counter bore. That's what standard on that. You don't ever make holes too tight. You, the standard usually is to be a 32nd over whatever the bolt that goes in there. Uh, sometimes you'll see them drill just maybe a 64th over if they're trying to get something to fit real tight and they're trying to cheat and not use any pins in it. But uh, we'll probably put some pins in this after we get it bolted together. Now you notice I'm holding this block. I could, I could put it in a little vise or something, but I'm just holding it with my hand here. 
that because drill press is the most dangerous machine in the shop, I think. You, you have to worry about these chips coming off. They'll cut you. Of course, if you were doing steel, aluminum ain't so bad, but aluminum's very grabby. It can seize up in there. And uh, so I'm wearing a kind of a big, heavy, I don't know, heavy glove here, cloth glove. Yeah, it might be it's leather. I guess it's leather. Uh, but the other thing I can do is be to block it, put, put something down in one of these slots, or put a screw in one of these holes so that if it did grab, it wouldn't spin all the way around on me. You know, this is a fairly small drill, so I think with this glove on, I can hold it fine with my hand. But you also don't want to uh, push a drill too fast, just to kind of take it easy and let it cut, because if you try to cram it through there, it's more likely to grab. Okay, when you counter bore, I'm going to use a little bit of lubricant on this. This is a tap magic for aluminum. And uh, I just put a little bit on there with a paintbrush. Looks like some kind of brush Rembrandt could use, but just a little bit of that on there. Maybe a little bit for the next hole here. But, uh, and you always uh, run the counter bore in the slowest speed that you got you that your drill press will run. And uh, set a stop. I set mine so as it's going to go down about that deep, which is maybe a little deeper than a little deeper than what I need to go. But uh, it'll get this screw head down below the surface, which is what I really want, and give me a little bit more thread into the other part. <clears throat> but. Uh, that's all there is to getting ready to counterbore this thing. This is kind of an oversized counterbore. I don't know where I got it, but it works, so that's the one I've been using. Okay, next thing I'm doing, I don't know if that camera will focus on it, but uh, that thing there is a transfer punch. Yeah, you can get a set of those at Harbor Freight if you don't have any. You lay this one block on top of the other. These are the two blocks we're going to bolt together. Put the transfer punch down in one of those holes you just drilled because you want to know where you're going to drill the, with the uh, tap drill. Put that in there and smack it. That transferred that particular hole. Now, the next thing I want to do, without moving anything, is put that transfer punch down in there, smash the up next one, and you'll see I got two holes in there now, or, or dimples in there, and that's where I'm going to drill for my uh, tap drill. So, <clears throat> that's all there is to it. And the tap drill, you have to get off tap drill chop, you can use the right size tap drill for a 1032 screw. The reason I use fine threads is because you don't have to tap so deep, you're less apt to break the tap. The root diameter of the thread is thicker with a fine thread, so the screw will take more load. And of course, being a fine thread, it'll tighten tighter too, so it's kind of important. I set my drill depth with a number 21 drill, which is a tap drill size for a 1032 thread. And I'm going to go in about that deep with it. You want to make sure your hole's plenty deep enough because that gives a place for the chips to go. And if your tap bottoms out, you might snap it off. And if you snap off a tap, tap you're uh, you're kind of done. So, and uh, for adjusting my depth, I don't I don't bother around, you know, moving this. I usually just move the table up. I set the part on there with this off like that and decide how deep I want it and just move my drill press table up. It's a lot faster than fill around that stop. That's good for fine adjustments, but otherwise I don't use it. Okay, next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to countersink that hole just a little bit because when you tap a hole, it's nice to have a little countersink at the start. Helps your tap start straighter, makes it a little easier on that first thread when you're trying to get that tap started so you don't break the tap. And of course, set the drill press in the in the slowest possible speed. And I just go in there a little bit to break the edge of the hole. OK, 
Okay, now I'm ready to tap the hole. What I have for doing that is a 1032 tap. Now you notice the way the end of that's ground. That's what they call a gun tap. It's designed to push the threads or the chips through the hole. The chips are going to go forward down the hole. Uh, usually you use these on a through hole. This, this is a blind hole. But if the hole went all the way through the piece, you could use this in a machine and just like run the drill press real slow on a real slow speed and it would start in there and, and go down in the hole and drive the chip ahead of it. It'll come out the other side of the hole. So they're very fast to use. But uh, there's also a thing called a tapping head you can use to do it. Uh, but in this case, I'm using it as a hand tap, and that's really not the best kind of tap to use for that. But as long as I, all, I all eyeball it straight, and this really has nothing to do with the uh, structure of the thing. It's just to hold these two blocks together temporarily, and they'll probably get drilled out anyway. Another thing you can do is if you have trouble starting to tap straight, you get yourself a little pocket mirror and you lay lay on there and put the bottom edge of the mirror right up against the tap and look down at the reflection and you can tell if that tap is going crooked by looking at the reflection in the mirror because you got like a double image makes it easier to tell if the tap's going in straight or not. But with this type of tap I don't really have to break the chips because it's pushing those chips ahead of it and they're going down in the bottom of that hole. But you still want to be real careful you don't accidentally, because if it snaps off that tap, you're done. You can't do anything. You can't get the tap out of there. Uh, taps are hard. You can't drill them out. There's nothing you can do, really. They have ta broken tap extractors and things, and if you really got in a bind, you could take it to somebody who had an EDM machine, and they can uh, machine it out of there, electrical discharge machining in it little sparks will eat that tap right out of there. But uh, I put a little bit of tap magic down the hole with that brush and that makes aluminum tap real nice. Aluminum's gummy and it it can give you a little burr or bug on there which kind of makes things seize up and and that can be a problem when you're drilling tap and sawing and stuff. So uh, if you don't have any tap magic plain old K1 kerosene works pretty well but I'm just kind of eyeballing this to get it started straight. If you take it easy, uh, sometimes at the start if you back it up, break the chip a little bit, then it'll straighten out on you. You know, go a little straighter then down the hole. But uh, anyways, that's all there is to tapping it. Turn this off. Now for getting chips out of the bottom of the hole, I use one of these things. You can get these over at Harbor Freight too. They have sell them in kits where there's different sizes of them. Uh, a lot of people think they're for blowing up basketballs and stuff. I guess they do have a use for that, but they have different ones. Like here's one that I made. This is a bigger one for bigger holes. So you can get down in there and blow air. And you'd stick this down in that hole and that will get all those chips out of there. That's the best way to, to clear them out is with one of these things in the blowgun. Next thing I did, took a flat file and I filed the top of this again to make sure I don't have any burrs or chips or anything on there when I bolt them together. I put the bluing on here uh, after I filed it to make sure there's no burrs on it. I uh, put the bluing on for no reason other than aesthetics so that you'll be able to see the cavity I'm cutting. I think it'll make a better video if that bluing's on there once I get the cavity cut. Uh, the reason these blocks are so thick is I think it's going to be a transfer mold and I'm going to have to make a pot in one of them to get the rubber to come in there. Although it won't take very much rubber to, to fill this thing. Next I'll be ready to bolt it together and square them up. Okay, now I've got the, the first step completed. They're bolted together. I'll put them in the lathe in a four jaw chuck to face these sides off and so they'll be square with everything else. Uh, the pins that are, or I mean the screws that are holding these two blocks together right now, uh, this would be the time to put 
uh, guide pins in there. I would drill those holes now while I got them bolted together. So that'll be step two, will be to put the guide pins hole. Just drill and ream where you're going to put the guide pins in. You don't have to put them in right now, even if you don't want to. If you, I don't think it'll move in the lathe when I drill it and stuff, but if you wanted to, you could you know, drill it and ream it and put the pins in now. But uh, uh, there's, what I'm going to do is bore a hole through the end of that, because what I'm trying to do is make this piece. That's going to be that's going to be on this side, so it looks like that in the cavity. Of course, it'll look the same on the other side. But uh, and I have to bore a hole through the center of it first, seven eighths inch diameter hole, uh, which I'll bore through there rather than just drill it. It'll be bored because uh, that's what size the handlebars are. It uses 7 8 bars, all motorcycles I think use 7 8 bars, except for Harley Davidson, they use 1 inch bars. But uh, and I think bicycles use 7 8 bars too. But anyways, uh, so that would be the first thing, to go all the way through right on this parting line with the 7 8 drill to go through there. Then I have to go in there with a boring bar and feed in and bore out this part here. So. The mold itself will look smaller now because of the rubber, but uh, it, it, this edge on the end of it, it won't be that radius there. It'll be a little bit smaller than that because it's got to fit on the handlebars. This thing clears the handlebars, I'm sure. It don't fit tight. So, <clears throat> and then uh, I'll figure out what size uh, to make it by you know, taking some that are put together, maybe I'll put the bolts in there and then measure what the diameter is in there. But I don't imagine it's too accurate because this wasn't machined, this was just cast in there. This is die cast. You can see there's a raised number in there, which they did by stamping that in the in the die casting mold when they made this. So this is not machined, this this part in here. But still I gotta get an idea what diameter is so I know how much rubber uh, to put in there because I want more rubber than just the clearance. I want to have enough so it'll squeeze in there. You can't compress rubber. Rubber goes solid if you squeeze it. I mean, it's it's a solid. It's not. Everybody thinks, well, rubber, you can compress rubber. No, you can displace rubber, but you can't compress it. When you push it one place, it's actually moving somewhere else. So, uh, anyways, that's that's what I'm going to do today. And uh, I don't think that'll take me too long. It's just a hole to drill through. And then somewhere here, I'll put a a pot on here probably to push the rubber in there, but it won't take a lot. But it's just a single cavity mold. Uh, but I think there's probably a lot of people need that part. I, I don't know what they're using, whether they're using a piece of garden hose or what they're putting in there. But I think if you had a molded part of the right stuff would be better. And uh, probably should be natural rubber, I would think, if you want to get rid of vibration. So that's what I'm working on there. Okay, I used the, the center. If you had a dead center, you can use that. In this case, I'm using a live center, but you can see where I put that right on that parting line, the, the point of that center, right where the two blocks come apart. That's where I'm going to bore my hole. But the first thing I'm going to do is face off this side just to get it smooth and flat, because that's just a rough saw cut on there. It'll look a little bit, and only take a second to do that. So that's the next step, and I'm going to drill a hole through the center of this whole thing has to come out the other side. And the four jaw chuck, these little lines help you get things concentric when you're, you know, before you try to indicate anything. In this case, I didn't have to indicate anything, but uh, uh, these, these concentric rings that they cut on a chuck face, if you look at the certain points on here and you make them the same, say you, say you put this corner here, even with this line or the outside of the chuck, on all four jaws, say this thing was square. This isn't, this is kind of rectangular on the end, but uh, it just helps you get things closer in the ballpark to being where you want it. And then you use a dial indicator to get real dead nuts work if you have to get it that close. Normally, if I had a piece like this and I wanted to put a hole through the center of it, I just blew it up and then I'd scribe a line between these corners here. And where they cross would be the center of that face, and that's where I'd try to get my my center on that. 
Okay, I'm ready to start doing some work. Now, what I did here is uh, I put this tool bit, I just used carbide on that. If you want any accuracy, you always use high speed steel. It cuts aluminum real nice and it'll give you exactly what you want. Carbide don't really cut, it just pushes it out of the way. But uh, uh, what I did was I faced it off, putting this cutter at this angle. I could face by feeding it in and, and feeding this way or starting in the center and then feeding it out this way from the center out. Either way you, could, you can face with this tool in there like that. And I just crank it by hand. I don't use any uh, automatic feed or anything like that because I really don't think I got to have that good a finish on this side. Uh, it's just the outside of this mold. And this ain't that smooth here anyway. And then of course I center drilled it and then put this 7 8 drill in there and slowly drill the hole all the way through. So now I got a 7 8 hole through there. And you might say, well, you know, why would you put 7 8 in there? Well, because the shrinkage, I'm going to have to bore this out anyways. It's going to have to be bigger than 7 8 to make it fit on a 7 8 handlebar. So uh, the other thing I'd tell you is these uh, drills have a tapered shank on them, which is a good thing to have drills like that because when you start getting bigger drills, you know, you go more than about 5 8 it's it's kind of hard to hold them in a half inch drill chuck. They, they want to spin in there and a tapered shank works a lot better. And uh, this, this drill would fit in a 9 inch south bend, but to fit it to the 13 inch you need what they call a sleeve. And I'll show you what the sleeve looks like. All you have to do is crank back on this. And when it hits the end of the shaft in there, that knocks it loose. And that's what they call a sleeve. And you put a drift in there. The drift is a kind of a tapered thing that you hit, put in there and hit with a hammer. Uh, I can show you a drift because there's one over here hanging on the drill press. This thing here is a drift. You could probably make one if you wanted to, but I'm sure you can buy them pretty dang cheap. But it's, I got it hanging here on a chain so it don't walk away. Sometimes these things at night, I think they come alive and they walk away and then you go, where's the drift? I can't find it. And, uh, but anyways, uh, you could make one on the saw or something. And with a saw and maybe a belt sander, you know, you could make a, a drift. Uh, to knock it loose, but you you put it in put it in through this. Oops! I can do it holding the camera at the same time. That's a little hard to do. Put it in here and hit it with a hammer, just a plastic hammer. Anything will work, and that'll knock that 7 8 drill out of that sleeve. Then you can use it on another drill. So <clears throat> uh, that way, I can use the same drill on a small lathe or a bigger lathe or on the drill press too. Uh, usually if you look at the drill press you'll see they have a a slot in them. Let's see if I can get this right. Yeah see that for 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 the drift you put in there and you can knock the, the chuck out of there. So okay well that's how that works. Okay I don't know how well this will focus on this but this is the boring bar I intend to use, uh, it has like a bushing goes on here to shim it up to one inch, which is what I normally use in that holder is a one inch boring bar, but this is a three quarter inch boring bar. And I gotta go in there for the full four inches, all, you know, all the way through. So I check to make sure that the boring bar is hanging out enough so it'll go all the way through. And uh, the first, the first thing I checked was, uh, you know, what kind of profile uh, goes in here, and I can see that this this corner in here isn't a real sharp corner or anything like that. And if it was sharp, well, even if I radius the piece of rubber, it's going to squeeze into it. So uh, what I did is I put a tool bit in there, which has to be just the right length, because if it sticks out too far on this side, it's going to hit the hole because the hole is only just slightly bigger than this boring bar, you know, than this tool bit here. So the tool bit, as you can see, it doesn't stick out of there too awful much, and it's pretty much, 
you know, symmetrical the way I sharpened it. So I think I can go and do, you know, the one corner and the other. So what I'm going to be boring in there is, you know, this right here. And it's going to go, you know, from here to there. I won't be able to see what I'm doing very good. But I can get my length right by setting stops on the lathe. So it only goes so far and then I stop. Uh, you can do stops and put a uh, blue line on, maybe, you know, put some bluing on your your ways and scribe a line that, you know, that would just have you stopping at the right spot. Uh, pieces of masking tape, you can put that on. It would show you where, you know, when you got the right length on that thing. But uh, first I'm going to try to go in and bore all the way through the whole thing, clear out the other side, uh, you know, through the whole mold. And that'll be the size of my mandrel because I had to allow for my expansion. So seven eighths, a, a drilled seven eighths inch hole is a little bit bigger than seven eighths. It's usually a drill hole is not undersized. It's going to be oversized, but maybe not by much, maybe five thousandths or so. But it's probably going to be a little oversized. So uh, instead of being eight seventy five, I got to go to about eight ninety one at least. And I might like it a little looser than that in there, so it's easy to get on the handlebars. I don't. I don't know, it looks like some of the parts, they're pretty mangled, the ones I got out, and they seem like they're uh, cut or slit down the length of them. Maybe that's how they get them on there, is it's because it's a cut bushing. But if it wasn't cut, you might be able to slide them on from the end of the handlebar and just slide them down to the center. But uh, if that doesn't work, you can always cut it, that's for sure, that's no problem. So uh, what I'm gonna try to do is is get my, you know, my wall stock, the wall thickness of this rubber uh, big enough so that when I tighten this this saddle clamp on there, it's going to put some squeeze on that rubber. And that would definitely hold the handlebars really tight. So that's the plan. So I'm going to do the boring and uh, see if I can go all the way through. That's the next step now. Now this thing's going to be real tricky. I want to show you what it is about it that makes it kind of tricky. Uh, mostly it's because I want a really big boring bar. If I had a 5 8 bar, I might try that. But I'm using a 3 quarter inch bar, which is about the maximum you'd use to go through a 7 8 hole. And you don't want the bar to rub on anything when it goes through there. So you have to have the bar pretty straight. The other thing you want is when you're boring a hole, you want your tool a little bit above center. Uh, when you're turning on the outside of something, if you, if you were turning the OD of this, you'd want your tool bit a little bit below center. Now I got my chuck jaws here vertical, so this this parting line across here where the two blocks are bolted together, that would represent the on center of the hole. And the tool bit is just slightly above center. The reason you do that is when you're boring, what you want is if the tool bit or the boring bar springs and bends down, pushes down, the tool bit doesn't dig in deeper, it digs in less. Because if it digs in more, then it kind of sets up a vibration and you'll get all kinds of chatter and stuff through there. So you got to have your tool bit a little bit above center when you're boring. And if you're on the outside turning, you'd want it a little bit below center. That way, when it, if it digs in or something, it's it's going to want to spring away from it, the work, not into it where it gets deeper, because that that'll always amplify and just get into a big chatter deal, and you won't get a good finish on it. So <clears throat> the other thing that makes it kind of tricky is I'll show you here down on the bottom here. You don't want the tool bit to rub on the bottom of the hole, and you don't want it to run on the side. And while it's going through there, you also got to check on this side that it's not rubbing on the side of the hole here. So you have to have your boring bar really in line with this hole because this is pretty deep. This is like four inches long. I'm going to bore here, and I don't I don't want to have the the boring bar rub on anything. So I got to keep my eye on it because even though it ain't rubbing at the start at the start of the bore. If, if the, the boring bar is off by too much at an angle or something, well, when it, when it goes through there, 
you know, out the other side, it might start rubbing on the side of this boring bar up here on this end. You know, say the boring bar is cut like that. It, it doesn't hurt for the way it's boring the hole, but you know, if this part, the front part of the hole may start rubbing up against this boring bar, and I don't want that to happen. So, I suppose if I really wanted to get exact, I could put a dial indicator or something on, make sure these are the boring bars really straight with those ways. But uh, I'm just eyeballing it here, but I think I got it pretty straight. Like I say, I can stop it if it looks like it's going to rub on something. It's a telescope gauge. You always store them loose. You don't ever have them cranked down tight when you store them. Just put a little tension on that and rock it through the hole like that. And that will give you the diameter that you got. Now I got a little bit of witness in there, so haven't taken out much. Well, well, pretty big. That's about 900 right there. And I I wanted 8 890 or so. And I'm about 904. So that's plenty. All right, so now I'm ready to do my bore. I'll put a little bit of this stuff in there. I can't get the chips out. That's a little bit of that tap magic stuff. If you don't have that, like I say, kerosene, that'll work. I'll engage my feed.
setting here on 80 so I go this way just enough to you know get it it doesn't drag the tool across the part so I don't mess up my finish and then I can set it right back here on 80 again you can put a paint dot there a chalk mark whatever you want to do a little piece of bluing and you can always go back to the same place all the time so all right now if I had another block to bore I could put it in the chuck center it all up and go through there and be the same size so that's good so I think I got what I want in there and it looks looks pretty good in there so that's all there is to bore in that now so I got that through there and so now I have to figure out what my wall thickness has to be and I'll do that by checking the castings with the telescope gauge to figure out what diameter it has to fit in that saddle what diameter that has to be and, uh, and then I'll do it by setting stops and stuff so now comes the tricky part uh, if I calculated this right I put the tool inside the block about 700 I'll, I'll have, should have about 700 on each end <clears throat> that's going to the, like the point of the tool bit and what I want to do is mill two inches, four hundred thousandths long. I want to bore out of there a bigger diameter, and I want to feed back on a side one hundred and twelve thousand. So it's only about a hundred thousandths uh, wall thickness. This this little rubber thing that goes in there. It's a pretty thin piece of rubber. That's why I think you can't get a piece of hose or something like that to put in there because it ain't going to be just right. It would be a little hard to figure. If it's bigger, I don't think it hurts too much. I mean, when you turn them screws down, it'll probably clamp. But anyways, how I'm going to do this is this. I set the center point right here so it, when it's touching the end of this boring bar, uh, that should be the start of my cut. If you can see the point of the, the, point of the center here right in line with the board bar on the end of it. Then I'll feed out 112 thousandths and then go this way. But I'm not sure I can take 112 thousandths at one time because there's not a lot of room for the chips to get out of there. It's kind of, it's kind of a tight squeeze with that big boring bar in there. So I'll put a little bit of this stuff in there too if that helps any. It gives you a smoother cut. Anyway. But, uh, so anyways, then it feeds two, two inches, four hundred thousandths here between the stop and this stop on the carriage. It should feed that far. Now I don't know whether I should try to take that all at once. That's an eighth inch. That's a pretty deep cut, although I got a pretty substantial boring bar. So that's why I wanted to mark my positions here so I can maybe make a couple passes, maybe three passes. I don't I'll see what happens when I feed back into it if I get chatter or if there's any problems. So that's that's the game plan. I got the carriage feed set slow as it'll go, so we'll see what happens now. Backlash is you know set so that no tool should move or anything. This thing's tight. It should go all right. We'll see what happens here. And I set this dial so when I get to zero. Down to this stop. 
here. I'll dissipate the feed. And I'll be close to the stop and take it in by hand because I don't want my stop to move. I want it to stay right here. And I just have to open pray. I calculated this right. Sometimes my math skills are really bad. Well, there's a lot wrong with it, but uh, I didn't get a very good finish on this one end, but that's because all the chips were binding up right in there. So, uh, but I think it's going to work out all right for what I want. Uh, these holes here, I still got to drill a hole, continue on through it. My drill wouldn't go down there. My drill press didn't have enough travel to go through this thick of block. So I'll put a hole in the bottom of these so I got a way to to drive out these dial pins here uh, if I ever need to but I'll I'll probably put them I suppose in the bottom half and uh, the thing you got to worry about with a mold like this is a guy laying a mandrel in there and then banging it off to the side or something but I don't think it's going to be too much problem I'm not sure if I got that other video but what I was saying was I didn't get a real good finish down on this end of the hole. This this part looks pretty good, but feels a little rough in there to me. Maybe I can smooth that up with some paper or something, but I don't think it'll hurt anything. Uh, but anyways, I, I still need to drill holes where the dial pins go. These dial pins will go in there. And I still need to drill a hole through, so I got a way to drive out the dial pins should I ever need to take it out. They're randomly drilled. Uh, not in the same distance from the end or anything, so that I don't think they can put this together, you know, bass backwards. It's it's got to be, you know, right for the dial pins to go in the hole. So uh, that's the next step to do, and you know, break the edges and stuff. And then I'll have to make a mandrel to put in here, and I'll probably probably have to take that mandrel and drill a hole and put a dial pin or something in it so that it locates in the right position. So when the guy puts a mold together, it's lined up right. But that's about all I can think of. And then it'll be just a matter of putting a pot in and figuring slots and things so you can pry the thing open if you need to. I'd show you how I work the chuck to center something up, you know, quicker than just fiddling with a dial indicator all the time. You can put a tool bit near what you're doing and then spin around and figure out what's the high and low side you know, to get it close before you put the dial indicator on. But uh, here what I did is I scribed an X where I want the pot to go on the side of this. That's where I'm going to bore my hole. And uh, the X with the scribers, just scribing an X between the corners of my mold here, that'll be close enough to get me centered good enough. And then I put the center in there and kind of hold that with the point, you know, back off the, the uh, chuck jaws and hold it there with the point of the center and then just run these jaws in because I can see them and see how close I'm getting and run them down and then you can get it pretty darn close uh, running the jaws in by eyeball as long as that's held clamped against the the face of the chuck with that point on there like that. So that's how I centered it up, and, and then after I did that, I could put a dial indicator on or something like that. But it doesn't do you any good to dial indicate on these corners because they're, they're, they could be anything, these corners. So I uh, don't need them. And as you notice, I put my rind cavity in the hole here by indicating in on this hole, getting it running true with that, and then I go in there, I measured from this edge in how far in I wanted that rind cavity because it's pretty hard to see in there. But I think I got something that'll that'll work. Makes parts come out a lot better if you have one of those. Okay, you can see my rind cavity in there. I just indicated it in, measured in where it had to go, because it's pretty hard to see in there what you're doing. And I got my rind cavity in there. And I've determined that I only want to go no more than one inch deep as far as I can go with this pot that I'm gonna put in. So I put the biggest drill I had with it that would fit in my chuck. I got a turn down shank on this, and because uh, you got to drill it first before you can start boring anything. And uh, I set the point of the drill even with the edge of the mold here. Set this at one inch on my scale on the tailstock. Lock down the tailstock here, so this tighten won't move. 
Now when I feed it in for one inch, the point of that drill won't be any closer, it won't go down in this block any closer than an inch uh, from the top. That's as far in as the point will go. The rest will have to do with a boring bar. But the drill's the fastest way to take it out, so I use the biggest one I can.